COVID-19 has brought disruption to the globalized and interconnected world. The challenges of COVID have led to a dark period, both in terms of human suffering, but also the damage done to our political and social fabric. But before the pandemic, globalization was already in retreat. Now, that trend looks set to accelerate. This is a diminished world in many ways that we're looking at. It's a world of globalization. From smartphones to toys, today's globalized trading system has grown to rely on long and complex supply chains. But the pandemic has played havoc with them. Clothing is one industry that has been hit hard. Worth $2.5 trillion globally, it employs over 43 million people in Asia alone. One of the most footloose industries when it comes to supply chain uh, has always been the garment industry. That's because it has a high level of human involvement. And so the labor cost of a product is much higher than you might find in an automobile, for example. For that reason, we've always seen companies chase the lowest cost. That means manufacturing mostly happens in Asia, and the global nature of the industry makes it especially vulnerable to disruptions. Take a typical pair of trousers sold on a high street in Western Europe. The label says made in Bangladesh, but many of the parts come from other countries. Chinese factories making buttons and zips shut during the pandemic, meaning the items didn't reach their next port. Factories in Bangladesh couldn't finish the trousers and cancelled orders to cotton suppliers in India. And lockdown hit demand in the West, as customers weren't shopping on high streets. In America, clothing sales fell by 73.5% between March and April this year. Bangladesh lost out on an estimated $3.2 billion from cancelled exports in just six months. <laughs> And across Asia, millions of low-income workers were laid off. Goods taking long journeys from factory to the high street have become one of the signatures of globalization. The roots of today's heavily globalized world were put down at the end of the Second World War. The Allied nations created a rules-based system for international commerce and finance. Designed to establish the economic foundations of peace, on the bedrock of genuine international cooperation. This allowed companies, products, science and technology to move across borders. Then, in the 1990s, the world entered an era of hyper-globalization, becoming more interconnected than ever before. A dream of money, money. We, of course, want in this era, the big new player on the scene was China, which joined the World Trade Organization. It grew to dominate global trade alongside the United States. Multinational companies thrived, expanding into China and all over the globe. From 1990 to 2008, the total trade in goods and services increased from 39% to 61% of world GDP. This great globalization boom enabled a billion people in developing countries to lift themselves out of poverty. And in the West, consumers enjoyed cheaper and more accessible travel and goods. COVID-19 struck a major blow to unfettered globalization. But before the pandemic arrived, Globalization had already taken two other big hits. The American financial system is rocked to its foundation. Japanese stocks down 9%, the Hong Kong market's down. Everywhere you look, the color is red, and no one, it seems, can stop the bleeding. The first was the 2008 financial crisis, when cross-border investment, trade, bank loans, and supply chains shrank. Globalization started to slow down, a process known as globalization. The global financial crisis a decade ago was perhaps an early sign of the beginnings of globalization. It wasn't recognized as such at the time because it seemed to be a, a banking crisis. The global economy suffered. 
and those who had already lost out during the heyday of globalization felt even poorer. Opposition to this system grew. And we see this kind of sentiment across Western democracies to bring the jobs back that were stolen when the factories moved, particularly to China. Those who were left behind very cruelly by the policies and people that supported globalization, that is, uh, the blue collar workers, for example, in factories uh, in Northern England or in the Midwest of America, the Trump voters. This desire to revive manufacturing and bring back dignity to workers spread across the Western world. A wave of populist leaders were elected across the globe, championing nationalist policies, attacking immigration and the existing global economy. Ho firmato due divieti d'ingresso nelle acque italiane a due ONG straniere cariche di centinaia di immigrati. The future does not belong to globalists. The future belongs to patriots. Free trade went out of fashion and protectionism was all the rage. The number of trade interventions, such as tariffs and subsidies, introduced by countries has been increasing year on year. And while some have brought liberalization, most have been harmful to world trade. In this climate, globalization suffered a second assault. We can't continue to allow China to rape our country, and that's what they're doing. A trade war blew up between the world's two largest economies. For years, the West had accused China of flouting WTO rules, saying its trading practices were unfair to Western companies. But President Trump turned rhetoric into policy. Since the start of his presidency, tariffs on Chinese exports to the US have increased sixfold. China hit back more than doubling its tariffs on US goods. The advent of the pandemic this year was the third big disruption to globalization within the last 12 years. Globalization has sped up. This year, the IMF forecasts that global GDP could fall by 4.9%. That is 50 times more than in 2009. The post-COVID world is likely to be a more fractious and regionalized one. What we saw for 20, 30 years with unfettered global trade, with unfettered global travel, with sourcing from China serving the world, I think we'll never go back to that. What we're likely to see is a messier world in future, one with elements of globalization continuing, but many other counter trends that lead to either regionalization, nationalization, localization, some form of de-globalization. And so we're going to a, a spiky world. We're going to see much more disruption. As multinationals try to navigate the challenges of the pandemic, the talk in the boardroom is increasingly about how to be less global and more local. They have seen how vulnerable their supply chains are to unanticipated disruption of a natural kind. For the first time at the level of the CEO and the board, companies are discussing supply chain risk and what to do about it and how to ensure against it. Now they're seeing this as something vital to the business. Some companies are ahead of the game. The Spanish clothing retailer Zara is one of the most successful in the clothing industry. And its shorter supply chains have helped the company weather the COVID storm. While most Western high street fashion brands have offshored manufacturing to Asia where labor is cheaper, distance equals time. So retailers have to bulk order six months in advance. And in that time, a lot can go out of fashion. Zara keeps its manufacturing base closer to home for its higher fashion lines, meaning it can take a design to the high street in a matter of weeks. That way it doesn't stockpile inventory and can respond quickly to consumer trends. That model is coming to, not just to fashion, but industry after industry is going to move in that direction, in part because the on-demand economy is allowing us to express our tastes through social commerce. We've seen a revolution that's driven both by fear of disruption on one hand, but also by the opportunities created by the internet economy. The pandemic has disrupted the movement of goods, people and capital around the globe. But even without COVID-19, another pillar of globalization would be facing challenges. The flow of data across borders. 
The Great Firewall of China has kept out the likes of Google and Facebook for years. And President Trump's recent attacks on TikTok and WeChat are deepening the splinter net between China and the West. We're looking at TikTok. We may be banning TikTok. And it's not just software. We confronted untrustworthy Chinese technology and telecom providers. We convinced many countries, many countries, and I did this myself for the most part, not to use Huawei. The decoupling of Chinese and American tech also extends to hardware. I think this is likely to lead to two worlds, a China-dominated world and an America-dominated world on technology and software, and ultimately we will have less innovation the unpicking of globalization may accelerate on a number of fronts, irrespective of when COVID-19 is brought under control. And this could be bad news for developing countries such as India. The globalization boom allowed countries in Southeast Asia to rise to middle income status. But the likes of India may miss out on this. There is a concern that we may see a leapfrogging in countries that are emerging. The way that China had a chance to put its massive population to work in factories. There is a worry that for developing countries that are just emerging at that stage, that the world may move to a post-industrial economy and leave them behind. This is a genuine concern. And they are not the only people who stand to lose out from deglobalization. In rich countries like the US and Britain, those most in favor of reigning in globalization could suffer the most. We're going to London to stop the Brexit betrayal. Good morning. Economic nationalism will not prove to be a silver bullet. It's very likely that uh, policies of deglobalization or economic nationalism that try to bring the factories back will discover that you can bring the factories back, but you can't bring the jobs back. That's because when the factories are brought back, almost always they will be more highly automated than they were in China. But even as the world becomes more deglobalized, some of the biggest winners from globalization will endure. Big digital companies like Netflix, Google and Facebook will keep getting bigger. With the pandemic accelerating the trend towards shopping online, companies following the Amazon model of fast, direct delivery will also do well. The top 10%, even in the worst sectors, worst meaning hardest hit sectors, could well emerge with a winning business model. I think in every crisis, you find some companies that fall behind, and those that are fundamentally able to rejig their business models and innovate are the ones that thrive. In the post-COVID world, some aspects of globalization affected by the pandemic may shift back, such as freedom to travel. The world has grown too integrated for a full unwinding of globalization. COVID will not kill it off. It will deepen the cracks. However, this may not be all bad news. I'm hopeful that we'll learn the right lessons that we need to make our societies more resilient so that we don't resort to very simple solutions that don't work, like shut down the supply chain, build a wall, keep the immigrants out. We've tried those things before. I think the broader solution is to make interdependence work with resilience. That's the challenge that global leaders face today. I'm Vijay Vaitiswaran, U.S. Business Editor of The Economist. If you'd like to find out more about the topic of the pandemic and the global economy, click on the link opposite. Thank you for watching.